So, um, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, uh, today we uh, have Ansgar Fryer uh, from uh, Technische Universität Wien, um, who will speak to us about affine subspace concentration conditions for uh, centered polytopes. Um, Ansgar, please. Yeah, thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me. It's really nice to be here. So, yeah, as you said, the talk is about affine subspace concentration conditions. That is a joint work together with Martin Henk and Christian Kipp that we finished a couple of months ago, so it's all quite recent. And the um, plan of the talk is to walk you through the history of subspace concentration conditions for polytopes, um, where they first occurred, which significance they play in convex geometry, and then pass on to um, the new version by Wu, which is dealing with affine subspaces for special lattice polytopes. And um, the goal of our talk is to give you a proof of a general version of this that actually works for all centered polytopes, at least the inequality. And then in the end of the talk, we will talk about the equality case because there are a lot of open questions um, around this equality case. So. Um, before I begin, let me um, show you the setting. So um, we always consider an n polytope P um, that is given to us in the following form. We always have inequalities that look like AI times X is less or equal than one uh, for certain vectors AI. So it's your usual scalar product here. And um, if we are given a polytope in this matter, if it's an n polytope in RN, then um, we always know that it contains the origin as an interior point. So we always assume that this is the case for P and we always assume that it's represented, represented like this throughout the talk. And also that this representation is a redundant. That means that I cannot remove any of these constraints without changing my polytope. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really important to keep this in mind, especially this normalization where the right-hand side is one because this is will turn out to be important. Um, that, this is how the AIs are normalized. And um, yeah, if we have a polytope given in this way, then if the constraints are irredundant, then every FI, where I'm looking at the points in P that um, achieve equality for one of these constraints, they are facets of the polytope. So n minus one dimensional parts of the boundary. And the main player in the context of the subspace concentration conditions um, are the cone volumes of a polytope. So the volumes of these pyramids that you obtain by building a pyramid with the base Fi and an apex as where you take the origin. So that this way you have a little pyramid inside of your polytope. And um, goal of the subspace concentration conditions is in a sense to understand how the volume of the polytope is distributed to these um, separate cones. So, and um, yeah, to give you um, like a warm up example, let's look at an origin symmetric polytope P. So we assume that minus P equals P. And we ask ourselves the question how much of the volume of P um, at most is, um, is given by two opposing cones in the polytope. So, as a first example, let's look at n equals two. If I have an origin symmetric polytope here, I can take a facet here on the left and then it's opposing facet on the right. I have two cones here. And if I just take the convex hull of these two cones in the plane, then this is always a parallelogram inside my polygon. And um, yeah, this two cones here, they make up half of the parallelogram. And by inclusion, you get that one half times the volume of P is the upper bound here. In higher dimensions, it's not very clear what to do. You cannot, so if you go ahead and um, take the convex hull of two opposing cones, it's quite hard to control what you get there. So um, turns out it's actually one over n times the volume of P in higher dimensions, but I think it's this is not clear to see. So it's a consequence of the first subspace concentration inequality by Heng, Schirmann, and Wills, who showed that if you have an asymmetric n polytope, you take a linear D subspace L, and now you're looking at all the normal vectors of your polytope, remember these AIs here, they are the normal vectors of the polytope, take all of them that fall in the subspace L and compute the volume of all these cones, then this is not more than D over N times the volume of P. So for our question, we would look at a one-dimensional subspace that 
just catches two opposing counts and end up with one over n times the volume of p. And um, yeah, this is, I think, the first time such a subspace concentration inequality was proven. And it was actually in the context of, um, yeah, so, so they used it as a lemma actually to uh, prove an inequality in Erhard theory that relates a coefficient of the Erhard polynomial to the successive minima of the polytope. Um, so, but later this um, inequality was proven in, independently, I think a year after this. So this was 2006 and I think 2007, Heiling and Lee proved the same inequality. And um, then later the equality case and this inequality has been characterized by Wawatsky, Ludwig, Yang and Zhang. And that was already in the context of the log Minkowski problem, which I'm going to touch on, on the next slide. So equality case for this inequality is that it's the following. So here's again the statement, you have a D subspace L, uh, volume is not more than D over N times the volume of P. And you have equality if and only if you find a complementary subspace L bar um, such that all the normal vectors of the polytope are either an L or an L bar. And um, here in the figure on the left, you see this rectangle, you have L is horizontal line and the vertical line L bar um, contains the normal vectors of the two remaining facets. And this thing here in the blue box is what people then call the linear subspace concentration condition. So it's the inequality together with the equality case, and we say polytope satisfies the linear subspace concentration condition if what is written in the box is true for the polytope. And um, so, yeah, so, so this condition um, was, was proven by Borotsky et al. in order to um, solve the log Minkowski problem um, for even measures. So let's have a look. Um, so suppose you're given a finite list of, of normal vectors, you want to UM, you take them together with their antipodal. Is it true that we find a polytope P? Um, it's origin symmetric, so it's you um, take the um, scalar product of ui times x, it's less or equal than the right hand side bi. So, this is the first and only time in the whole talk that we deviate from this presentation that we saw in the beginning. So, this time we've normalized um, vectors actually. We're looking for some right hand side such that we get a polytope with this normal vectors and the corresponding cones have exactly cone volume gamma i. So even log Minkowski problem asks for a condition on this list of the ui's and the gamma i's, um, you know, such that such a polytope exists. And since, since we know that the linear subspace concentration condition holds, um, we know that the following, the gamma i's have to satisfy the following, namely whenever I take a linear d subspace, looking at all the ui's that are in the d subspace and i want that the sum of the gamma i's which are supposed to be the cone volumes is less or equal than d over n times the sum of all the gamma i's because then the sum of all the gamma i's they will make up the volume of the whole pointer and um again you equality should hold if and only if i can um, distribute the ui's over l and the complementary subspace l bar and what Boretsky, Ludwig, Yang, and Zhang actually showed is that this condition is not only necessary, but it's also sufficient. So you find such a polytope if and only if um, your facet data is of this form. And um, so this is the even case where you have a list of normal vectors together with their antipodals, and you're looking for an origin symmetric polytope. And in the general case where you're just given some normal vectors, some um, Cone volumes and you're happy with any polytope, then this problem is actually open. And it's yeah, uh, one of the major problems in convex geometry today. And the question then is what are the necessary conditions and also the sufficient conditions uh, in this case? And yeah, if you look again at the subspace concentration conditions in the general case, you have to have, so if you don't have origin symmetry, you want that the origin is contained fairly inside the polytope 
for these concentration conditions to make sense. I mean, if it's just an interior point, but maybe very, think of a triangle where the origin is very close to one of the vertices, then one cone is almost all the polytope in these upper bounds that you get by the subspace concentration conditions. They don't really, would not be really meaningful in this sense. So that's why people started looking at center polytopes, which are polytopes where the center of mass is the origin. So the centroid is the, you integrate over P and just take X dx, so it's a vector value of integral. You normalize it by the volume of P. And the centroid is really literally the center of mass. So if you think of a two-dimensional polytope and you place it on your, your finger, you place your finger exactly under the center, it should not fall to either side. And we don't say that the polytope is centered if this centroid is exactly the origin. And for centered polytopes, there's hope for such a subspace concentration condition. And indeed, um, Hank and Linke showed that centered polytopes satisfy the linear subspace con cent concentration conditions exactly as the origin symmetric polytopes did. So for any D subspace, subspace concentration inequality holds with the same equality case. And um, yeah, so if you look at the log Minkowski problem and you want to reconstruct a center polytope, then um, this theorem tells you that subspace concentration is a necessary condition. And what I also want to highlight here at this point is that here we're back with the AIs, and it really doesn't matter for, um, for the linear case if you take the AIs or the normalized UIs on the sphere, because you, um, no matter how you normalize your vectors, they will always, the linear subspaces they are in, they will always be the same, because linear subspaces are just invariant to scaling. And um, yeah, so this was the part on the development of the linear subspace concentration conditions. And recently, at the beginning of this year, um, Hering, Nil, and Süß, they found a new interpretation of these linear subspace concentration conditions in the framework of toric geometry. And um, this enabled Wu to derive the affine subspace concentration conditions. So using the result of Hering, Nil, and Süß, he could show that if you have a centered polytope that's in addition reflexive and smooth, I'll tell you later what this actually means, but it's, um, for now, let me just say it's a very, these are very special lattice polytopes of which there are only finitely many per dimension. Um, for those, he showed um, the affine subspace concentration condition, um, which reads very similar to the linear case. This time you take an affine D subspace A, and again, you're looking at all the AIs that um, fall in the subspace A, and the volume, look at the volume of the cones, and this is then not more than D plus one over N plus one, so you have an extra plus one every time, times the volume of P. And equality is supposed to hold if and only if um, the normal vectors can be distributed over affine space AI A, and a complementary space a bar, where complementary this time is in the affine sense. So A and A bar are disjoint, and their affine hull is all of R to the N. And here on the right on the figure, we see um, an example of um, such an equality case. So here we have a centered simplex, and um, here we have the white dots, this one, this one, this one, they are supposed to be our AIs. And of course, these two are on the line as are any two points in the plane. But now we can look at the affine subspace concentration. And in fact, these are two thirds of the volume of the whole triangle. And so we have equality. And this is because this line together with this point spans the whole plane. So these reflexive and smooth polytopes, um, what they are, are lattice polytopes with the special property that their polar dual is again a lattice polytope. And the smoothness means that at every vertex, you have exactly n facets. And the normal vectors of these facets, they form a basis of the integer lattice. So this is very, very special and very particular. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's actually not important for the rest of the talk because our goal is to really um, give a geometric proof of the inequality that actually works for centered polytopes. Um, yeah. But before we do, let's um, let's look at this condition 
once again. So, um, so here, here it is again on the left. And the first, first, first thing that we notice here is that the normalization of the AIs is, is really critical here. This wasn't the case for the, in the linear setting, but in the affine setting, um, yeah, if you change the normalization, you get a you get a different statement here because if I if I'm to dilate my normal vectors, then I I might change the affine dependencies between them, and this inequalities would then speak about different subset of subsets of cones. So you might wonder what is so special about this normalization with the right hand side being equal to one. What does this mean for the facets of the cones that are then finally dependent? And um, so the way this one, one can picture this is that if um, the normal vectors AI1 up to AIK lie in a, in a common affine D subspace, then um, this means that if you take the facets that correspond to these normal vectors and extend these facets to their whole affine hull and build the intersection, then this intersection is an affine N minus D minus one subspace. So I think of those as sort of a twisted belt that goes around the polytope. Here we have an example here on the on the bottom left where there's the truncated pyramid. And then of course, if I extend the four facets that would have led to the apex, then of course they intersect at this very apex. And this is the this is how it how um, facets look with the property that they are affine hearts intersect in a single point. And in particular, what we see from this is that whenever I take um, take uh, any phase, an n minus d minus one phase for some d, um, g, and I'm looking at all the normal vectors such that g is contained in the corresponding facets, um, and the affine hull of the set is always d-dimensional. So this, um, the subspace concentration conditions in this way they always include um always include the normal vectors ai um yeah that are active together at some some um k phase g of the polytope okay um yeah so this is the fn fn subspace concentration condition and our goal for the talk is to um prove them for general polytopes. And um, to begin, let us look at a special case that um, maybe gives us a bit of an intuition how the centeredness comes into play and how these sorts of inequalities work. Um, so we have a centered end polytope P and now we take a vertex V of the polytope. And um, yeah, as before, we're looking at A, which is the affine hull of all the normal vectors that are active at this vertex. And this is then a hyperplane. And if the affine subspace concentration condition is correct, then the volume of um, all the cones that correspond to these normal vectors is not more than n over n plus one times the volume of p. So here's a polytope, here's the vertex v, and we're interested in these cones that um, belong to facets that contain v. OK, so how can we see that this inequality is correct? Well, in this special case, what we can do is exploit the centeredness right away because for a centered polytope, it is known that I can reflect the vertex V and dial, uh, shrink it by a factor one over N to get minus one over N times V as a point inside the polytope. And I can then build the cone I call CI bar, mm -hmm. where instead of, um, instead of the origin as an apex, I take this reflected vertex and then if you compute the distance of this vertex to the hyperplane fi, then you find that the volume of this cone is n plus one over n times the volume of the original cone. And now if you use the inclusion, so the volume of p is greater than the volume of all these cones, and this is then n plus one over n times the volume of all your cones. So this should actually be an equality sign even. And um, yeah, this, this is how you do it in the special case, but um, yeah, this argument doesn't really seem to extend because um, in general, if you are, for example, looking at um, cones that meet at a edge or some K phase, then it's not enough just to reflect this edge. Um, this 
um, yeah, will will yield something that is not tight then. And um, so what we can sh show using an entirely different argument actually is that the inequality is correct um, up to the equality case, which we don't know. So um, if you have any centered polytope, then you have the affine subspace concentration inequality. And what we do in the proof is we construct um, pyramids over pyramids over pyramids and let the dimension go to infinity. And this way, by this limit process, we lose the control over the equality case. So I would like to show you the proof because I, I think it's interesting because it, yeah, at each step in each dimension, we're doing something that's actually far from optimal and still we obtain an um, inequality that is actually tight. So let's see how this goes. Um, so what we do is start with our pyramid uh, or polytope P and we build a pyramid um, in the following way. So build, by the way, building the pyramid and lifting it to a higher dimension is um, quite quite natural here, I think, because we want to go from the new affine setting to the linear setting. And there, of course, of course, lifting and homogenizing is, is a natural way to go. So that's why we try this and build, build this pyramid by embedding P at height one. And as an apex, we choose minus n times the n plus one unit vector in Rn plus one. And um, yeah, we have to, we want to, um, use the linear setting. We have to write down the inequalities. Um, these are x n plus one is less or equal than one. That's the inequality for the base. And each facet of P yields a facet of the pyramid um, with some normal vector a i one, which if you write it down, if you want the right hand side to be one, is n plus two over n plus one times the original vector, and you append minus one over n plus one in the last coordinate. So this looks a bit technical, but what is really important about this is that the coordinate that we append is constant. It's the same for every i. And that's something we have to keep in mind for what follows. Um, okay, so this is first of all a pyramid. And then we can check that the volume of this pyramid is n plus 2 over n plus 1 times the volume of p, because I mean, its height is n plus two. We have p embedded at height one, and the apex at height minus n. Oh, oh sorry, oh, that, sh that should actually be minus n plus one, I'm sorry. So we want to do it in such a way that the polytope is, um, is centered. So, so here in the figure, it's right, it's minus n plus one. And, um, and if you do it that way, then actually the, you can also check that this pyramid is centered. And moreover, um, the volume of the cones that correspond to these new normal vectors, the n plus one dimensional volume is the same as the n dimensional volume of the original cone. So this n plus one in the subscript here means I'm measuring the volume of something that is n plus one dimensional. And what this means is, I mean, you have a cone CI for every facet in P, and since facets in P also yield facets of the pyramid, there are also cones that correspond to this. So that's this blue cone here. And um, yeah, that's almost a pyramid over CI, but you're lacking this part. And that's why it's not n plus two over n plus one, but exactly one. And um, okay, let's, so, so here's what we just did um, wrapped up again. And um, if I now take the affine D subspace A, um, then I can assume that it's given to us as the f and hull of some um, some of the normal vectors. If this is not the case, then we can just restrict to the f and hulls of all the AIs that are in A and just make make our lives harder this way. And now I can can homogenize this um, f and space by building L one. This is the linear hull of all the normal vectors of the AIs. Um, and since we only appended a um, constant last coordinate, this is a linear d plus one dimensional space. And with all this information at hand, we can now try to apply the linear subspace concentration inequality and see what we get. So if I'm interested in the volume of the CIs that fall in this affine space, then I can say that this is 
exactly the same as the volume of the CI ones, the corresponding cones in the pyramid. And using the linear subspace concentration there, we have d plus one over n plus one times the volume of the pyramid, which is n plus two over n plus one times the volume of p. So we're almost there. We almost have our inequality, except for this factor n plus two over n plus one, which is almost one, but not quite. And um, yeah, so what we then do is to just iterate this procedure and we um, take our pyramid P1 and build a pyramid P2 in the same manner as we did before. And this way we obtain a whole sequence of pyramids Pj, each of them sitting in Rn plus J, um, such that the volume of the N plus J's pyramid is as before N plus J plus one over N plus J times the volume of the Pj minus one's pyramid. And if you do this over and over and cancel this telescopic product that you get, then you see that it's m plus j plus one over m plus one times the volume of the original polytope. The same way, the cones that correspond to these normal vectors a, i, j, they have the same m plus j dimensional volume as the cones that we were originally interested in. So what this means is that I, I take the ci, it has some normal vector a, i, and I trace this normal vector throughout the pyramids. So before we um, obtained this cone CI1, and now by building the next pyramid, I get also get another cone CI2 inside this pyramid. And their volumes, they're all the same. And um, this is actually the key observation in, in the proof. So if I'm now looking at the linear spaces that I get by um, taking the linear hull of these AIJs, then these are still d plus one dimensional spaces. Because again, if I pass from AI1 to AI2, all I do is rescale a little bit and I append a constant coordinate that does not depend um, on the particular AI. And if I, the first time I apply, I, I append this constant coordinate, I go up one dimension, but um, the second time I do it, I don't add anything new. So um, that's why these spaces are all, all of the same dimension. And this time we can again apply the linear subspace concentration conditions in Rn plus J to this pyramid. And yeah, we again find that the volume of the cones that we're interested in is the volume of the new cones in the higher dimension. Uh, it's less or equal in D plus one because we're still D plus one dimensional over M plus J, the ambient dimension times the volume of the pyramid. And um, the volume of the pyramid we set is m plus j over m plus one. And if we plug this in, rearrange a bit, we have this error term m plus j plus one over m plus j. And by letting j go to infinity, um, this does indeed tend to one and we, we are left with the desired inequality. So yeah, that's, that's how we prove our affine subspace concentration inequality for the centered polytopes. But yeah, as you see um, in this limit procedure here, it's really hard to um, keep track of the equality case. And that's why I want to use the remainder of the time to discuss this in a bit more detail and also revisit this step in the proof here once more. So let us recall. Um, so we look at the centered polytope P. We have A and L being D spaces, A is affine, L is linear. And then what Henk and Linke showed for the linear case is that we have equality in the linear subspace concentration conditions if and only if normal vectors are distributed over these two complementary spaces. So this is a very handy um, characterization for the um, Lokmikowski problem where you want to, um, where you want to, you're looking at the normal vectors and the cone volumes. But if, you, if you're given the polytope, you might ask, what does this tell me about my polytope? How does it look like? It looks like a sum. So it's the sum of a D polytope Q and an N minus D polytope Q2. So this is geometrically, this is the equality case in the linear subspace concentration condition. And this is interesting, I think, because um, in our case, we applied the linear subspace concentration condition all the time to pyramids. And a pyramid is not a sum of two non-trivial polytopes. So what we did there was could not have been optimal, could not have been tied in any step. And 
still due to the limited kind of works out. And um, yeah, let's compare this with the FN case. So this, um, it's very beautiful and similar. So what Wu showed for reflexive and smooth polytopes is um, that you have equality if and only if um, the normal vectors yeah, they fall into a complementary affine subspaces. And again, you might ask, what does this mean for the polytope? As I said, these AIs here, they are the normal vectors of the polytope. So this means that the polar, uh, the normal vectors of the polytope, and that's why uh, they are the vertices of the polar. And if the vertices of the polar fall in two complementary spaces, then they are a join, and then actually P itself is a join. So this means that I can express it as the convex hull of two skew polytopes, Q1 and Q2. Q1 is d-dimensional and Q2 is n minus d minus one dimension. So what this figure here is supposed to show are two skew segments and their convex hull form simplex. And what's interesting is that a smooth polytope is um, in particular a simple polytope. And a simple polytope is a join if and only if it is a simplex. So um, in many cases, this. So in the case of this um, particular reflexive and smooth polytopes, this equality case always comes down to actually a simplex. But, um, but still, this is in the more general case, um, you can really have a proper join of two polytopes that are not simplices. And it seems to be the you know, natural counterpart, but we're not able to prove it in full generality. But let us visit, revisit the special case that we saw in the beginning, where we um, look at a centered polytope and we take the hyperplane that is spanned by all the normal vectors that are active at some vertex. And for convenience, we assume that the volume of our whole polytope is one. And um, so before, when we um, derive the affine subspace concentration inequality for in this setting, we use this trick of flipping the vertex over inside the polytope using the sentence. From that, it is not clear um, how the equality case looked like. You can do it. And we, we came up with a characterization of the equality case in these fully geometric terms, but that's, I think, really particular to this case. And we also found another more analytic way of seeing it that we have the hope that it might be extended to other special cases. And this is what I, I would like to present here. Um, so what you can do is you can express um, the volume of the cones that you're interested in as the following integral, where you integrate over P and you take um, the volume of yeah, some cones with apex X and um, base Fi for all the normal vectors in this hyperplane. The reason why this works is that this function here is an affine function on the polytope because all that all that matters for this functional is the distance of x to the hyperplane f of n and as this function is affine we can pull the integral inside and use that the centroid is really the um yeah expected point in the polytope if you like so if you it's a, yeah look at it stochastically, then X is a random point in the polytope. And um, yeah, expressing it this way and rearranging it a little bit, we write it as one minus the integral from zero to one. And we um, look at this um, sublevel sets that we integrate. So we integrate the volume of P intersected with the set where F or affine function is less or equal than T. And since F is an affine function, what we do here is we intersect our polytope with a new half space where f is less or equal than t. This gives us a polytope pt, a new polytope. And of course, um, pt is equal to p for all t. Oh, there's an f missing here, sorry. For all t that are greater than the maximum that f, here it should be an f, achieves on the polytope. And uh, what is maybe more interesting is that p0 um, is exactly the vertex v. So there's exactly one point um, in our polytope that achieves the value zero, and um, that's this this vertex here. It's just by definition of this hyperplane H that says that yeah, we're looking at all the AIs 
where um, V is contained in the corresponding FI. That's why we only have this one point here. And um, using the convexity, um, you can now say that for all T, that's less than the maximum of F on P. Um, this PT is, um, it always contains the convex combination of PM and T minus M over M times P0. And as P0 is just a point, this means that it always contains a homothetic copy of T over M times P. And yeah, plugging this in, we, um, yeah, this integral from zero to one now goes from zero to M and one minus M is separate. And yeah, we have just this nice and handy analytic expression. We can um, see that this is maximal of M is equal to one, and then it's N over M plus one. And as we normalize the volume to one, this is what we wanted to show. Um, so yeah, this, so far this is just a different way to verify the subspace con affine subspace concentration condition in this case. But um, what we now see is that the affine subspace concentration condition holds, and then we can have equality if and only if this function in T, where we're looking at um, the intersection of P with this um, sublevel set of our affine functional is exactly T over N times the volume of P. And from this identity, you can now derive that P actually must be a polytope that um, contains V as a vertex and has a base somewhere in the affine hyperplane given by F equals to one. Um, you, can, you can see this, for example, by um, taking the derivative of this and then seeing that this is the intersection function of a pyramid um, it can also be done by just elementary means and yeah, really using the convexity. And um, yeah, we have some hope that maybe one can one can generalize this argument to either um, affine spaces um, that yeah, the ones that we saw before where we are looking at all the AIs that are active at some K phase, not only a vertex, but general K phase, or alternatively to arbitrary hyperplanes. But for arbitrary hyperplanes, um, I mean, so I can tell you what the problems for both these attempts to generalize are. So if you want to generalize to a K phase, somehow have to get the dimension of this phase into your argument. And that's why you yeah, cannot use this the simple inclusion, but you have to yeah, exploit the dimension of this phase to um, order for it to appear in, um, in this function here. And the problem with arbitrary hyperplanes is that um, you don't know that um, P0 is exactly one point, but it might just be, um, might just be the empty set because there are, if you're not, if you, if you have an arbitrary hyperplane, this means that the affine hulls of the facets intersect in a point outside the polytope. And so inside the polytope, whatever point you choose, it will have a positive distance to one of the hyperplanes. So you cannot achieve zero in the polytope. And then this um, inclusion argument also wouldn't work. Okay, um, yeah, so this is about the special case. So to conclude, I would um, just, yeah, conclude with two remarks. So the first one is that using um, arguments similar to, um, to a proof of Grünbaum for a slicing inequality for centered convex bodies, we can verify the equality case um, where D is equal to zero. So the way this works is, you have D equals zero means that the affine space just consists of a single point. So we're only interested in one cone. Um, so here we start with the red polytope. We take the cone and what we then do is we say, okay, let's um, keep the facet and build a pyramid over it that has the same volume than the polytope. And what one then has to check, and this has essentially also been done by Grünbaum, is that in this construction, um, the new centroid, the centroid of the new pyramid wanders away from the facet. So while the volume stays the same, the um, volume of the coning increases, or at least not decreases. 
and and actually it does increase. So and that's why we get the characterization of the equality case. So as soon as the series is not a pyramid, it does move to the left. And yeah, so these are the cases where we can characterize the equality case. And another thing that we stumbled over while thinking about this is that if it is the, the equality condition that we proposed is correct, then we can have equality only if we have an affine space of the special form where we take the normal vectors that are active at some phase. And um, so here in this figure, we see, we see an example of this where we have the normal vectors active at a vertex. And here, yeah, for if it if the equality condition is correct, then we won't have equality for something like this trapezoid here. And of course, in particular, not for this rectangle here. There we are actually in the linear case where we have a much smaller constant, namely d over n instead of d plus one over n plus one. So, I mean, this is a very vague question, but it kind of feels that um, one, maybe one should capture how far um, an affine space is from being, um, yeah, um, of this all normals meet at a phase type. So in other words, to interpolate from this setting where um, I'm only collecting normals at a phase to the other extremal where I'm looking at all the no normals in a linear space. And um, yeah, I think that's that's it from my side. So um, so far, thank you very much for your attention and yeah, if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Ansgar. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Uh, I have a question. Um, what you're trying to prove right now, would it have any relevance to any versions of the log Minkowski problem as well? Um, okay. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And we we thought about this too. But the problem is, of course, that you, in the log Minkowski setting, you have, um, where is it? Um, you're always dealing with normalized vectors there because um, yeah, you are you're given normal vectors and cone volumes and you want to reconstruct a polytope from this. And um, if, yeah, if you're given such a list of vectors, it's not clear how the affine dependencies among the AIs look like, because if, yeah, if I know the AIs, then I know the Essentially, I know the support function of the polytope. And once I know the support function, I don't need to reconstruct anymore. But um, still, I would not say it's entirely useless because you can use the affine subspace concentration conditions, I think, to rule out certain um, combinatorial types of the polytope that is reconstructed. You can see that, OK, I cannot. Um, if I think of the polar dual, I cannot group the vertices of the dual that belong to U1 up to UK in one common K phase, because otherwise I would get a problem with the FN subspace concentration. So this, in, in so far, it might be applicable, but it's not, it's not a condition in the sense that the linear ones are that we can write down straight away in terms of the UIs and the cone volumes. Okay. Uh, something else, are there any other such uh, conditions, uh, variations of that for non-standard polytopes? Um, I'm not sure. Um, so Can you consider, say, the Santa low point instead? Um, you mean other? Um... Have the origin at the Santa low point and have some condition in that in those cases. For the Lokmankowski problem, uh, or the sub, uh, subspace concentration conditions, mm -hmm. like very, um, uh, 
counterpart to that. Yeah. Yeah, as, as far as the subspace concentration conditions, as well as the affine and the linear ones are concerned, I'm not really sure because, I mean, yeah, it's also something we've been looking at to study the set of points. So if I'm given a polytope, how do the points inside the polytope look like for which, if I would translate the polytope such that this is the origin, um, such that the affine or linear subspace concentration condition hold. and. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, yeah, I think it would be interesting to study these sets because they're actually also polytopes, just because you only need to consider a finite amount of, only a finite amount of spaces here are relevant, namely the ones that are actually being spanned by normal vectors. And um, yeah, but I'm, I'm afraid I cannot tell you too much about these, um, these sets and how they look like. Um, so in the other direction, it is known that once you have some polytope, uh, no, not some polytope, but once you have some set of facet data or cone data that satisfies the linear subspace concentration condition, you can reconstruct a polytope from this, but it then does not be need to be unique. So, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know how it how the situation is if you want to reconstruct a unique let's say centered polytope in some way or another centered with respect to the centroid center low point i don't know um i think these these problems are mostly open okay any other questions or comments If not, let's thank Ansgar again, and um, we'll see you again next week. Yeah, thank you very much.